talk about that later on. Oh. You've got a fan base here, though. <laughs> the hype train has left the station. <laughs> this was 12 years 12 years yeah man mm-hmm. it is good he just threw all of that on the floor and this man has no regard for safety he is not wearing shoes he could go down while using this and john's dead wow that didn't take long at all but i'm sure he'll come back we talk about whiskey um we are joined tonight with greg snyder of chicken cock whiskey uh long-standing veteran of the industry so super cool to have him on with us tonight and yeah i think uh how you been doing john how you been doing greg i'm doing great guys i appreciate the opportunity to meet with you tonight and uh talk my favorite subject and that's whiskey <laughs> i like right. it i think we'll be in good shape then yeah <laughs> man it's been a long day for me here too so it's it's nice to finally be sitting down with a with a glass of something excellent excellent Let's see. I think uh, usually we lead with our bourbon news. I don't think we have a ton of news this week. All the barrels are in flux. Um, Greg, we for the our bourbon subreddit, we, we're picking like six or seven barrels this fall. And I think this is one of the rare weeks we don't have any news. Russell should hit soon. Smooth Amber will hit in a week or two. New Riff is scheduled for November, and, and that's about that. So what, what have you been up to, John? Well, you know, it's been one of those long weeks, even though we're uh, not very far into the week yet. But I think we're going to make it through. We got some whiskey to sip on tonight, and uh, one hell of a guest to come in here and chat with us about his massive career here in the industry, and talk a little bit about this brand that they got going on. So I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah. Let's see who's up in the chat here. What everybody's drinking? Let us know what you guys are sipping on, so we can kind of you know live vicariously through you, pretend that we're drinking that. It's like we get a little uh, wild turkey <laughs> rare breed going. Yeah, that's always a hit. Good way to fire up a Tuesday night. <laughs> uh, there we go. You drinking anything, right. Greg? Or besides, obviously, you're here on behalf of Chicken well, Cock. It's funny you saw me Wild Turkey. You guys probably had a copy of my bio, but yeah, I was managing director of Wild Turkey for, uh, for over 10 years. And, and a lot of people don't realize it, but I actually created the Russell's Reserve brand. So, <laughs> Oh, man. That's oh, you have got. We can talk about that later on. Oh. You have got a fan base here. Then. The hype train has <laughs> left the station. Oh man! Oh, we got a chocolate milk drinker tonight. Okay, that's uh, that's okay, a new right one in. for us. There you go. <laughs> and a little old Forest of 1920. Good choice. It's funny because that's that's what I was planning to drink like an hour ago before my coffee maker broke, and I had to find a way yeah. to fix it. Oops. Oh. That's a rough. At one. least you found out that it broke tonight and not tomorrow morning when you were like really desperately needing it yeah and it's not even like broke broke it'll only make one half of a cup like a pot of coffee no matter how much water you put in it will only make half of it and i can't figure it out huh angel share so <laughs> but cool well what do you say should we uh should we dive on in here let's do it let's dig in cool well thanks again uh for joining us greg i mean you you've been doing this for Honestly, I'll be honest with you. You've been doing this for longer than I've been alive. So that's that's impressive. First off, that's that's some perseverance, and uh, and a very changing industry. So how how did you kind of get started? I I I have your like your list of things actually goes off my screen. I have to scroll to get to the top and bottom. But uh, you know what what got you into whiskey a, a million billion years ago? You know, it was just a stroke of faith, guys. I uh, uh, you know right out of college, uh, I have a business degree from Indiana University, and and. Uh, you know, your senior year through career placement, they post uh, uh, interviews, companies that want to come interview uh, graduates. And, and uh, Joseph E. Sigerman's son had a facility over in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, they were one of the, the, the companies that were uh, posted an interview. So I interviewed with them and uh, was one of the, the opportunities I got uh, to start my career. And so I said, you know, that's something I think I'd like to try. And so it was a frontline supervisor position. And. So I, I uh, took the interview, was fortunate enough to get the, the job and, and uh, started out as a frontline supervisor in the, in the barrel warehouse department and uh, was there about three weeks and I was moved to maintenance, but uh, as a maintenance supervisor, but you know, it's, it's, it, it was a great training ground. Um, that facility no longer exists. In, in uh, 1983, they actually shut it down, but 1978, June of 1978 is when I started in this industry. And, uh, 
you know, at Seagram's at that time, if, if, if you wanted to learn and were aggressive and, and pick things up fairly quickly, they gave me the opportunity to move around. And so literally in the five years that facility was open, I worked in, in every, uh, every, every plant or every, every division, every department within that facility from, you know, the distillery and dryer house to the barrel warehouse to, you know, filling barrels, putting barrels away, taking barrels out, dumping barrels, uh, filtration processing, um, you know, receiving, shipping, bottling, quality, maintenance, uh, you name it. I had an opportunity to, to work in basically everything. And so it was just, it was a great training ground. And, and uh, you know, as, as they say, it kind of gets in your blood. And, and I mean, I loved it from day one. It just, uh, it was uh, very fortunate uh, that I, I chose the right career right from the start and, and stuck with it for all these years, over 42 years now. So, man. That yeah, that's standard. wild. Especially to be able to just kind of move around like, you know, that's that's jack of all trades by, you know, early on. Yeah, so, sort of like a baptism by fire there. <laughs> kind of throw you around into every role that you see what sticks. Yeah, well, you know, it, again, it was uh, I was very fortunate to put, be put on that fast track. Not everybody has that opportunity, but uh, to, to gain that much exposure in, in that short period of time was was something that was fairly unusual. And, and uh, again, I'm very thankful for it. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. And it's it kind of paved the way and laid the foundation for, for my career. So, wow, that's wild. I think I'm trying to think when I, at least when I was coming out of college, like, so I, I'm in software, you know, not, not a lot of the distilleries are looking for software people. I, I would have, uh, that's, that's, that's an interesting foray into it, which is pretty cool. Like, Oh, and John's dead. Wow. Oh. That didn't take long at all, but I'm sure he'll come back. Let's see. <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah. So you got to start, was there a particular favorite of those? Like, well, obviously we know where you ended up now, but, um, you know, of those, those different five different departments, you know, which one struck, struck you the most? No, I guess, you know, it, it was, it was great to see how they all interacted, you know, from, cause what you learn in one department really helped you in other departments to, to better understand what you were doing and what needed to be done into the next step of the process. So, you know, it, it really, uh, you know, the, the full integration of it was, was very beneficial in my mind. I mean, there, there were so, a lot of people that, you know, went into that and they, they just kind of focused and stayed in one department their entire career. And that's okay. But I, you know, I, I wanted to learn. I, I was aggressive and I, I just was, was anxious to get on my career and, and do the best <laughs> I could. And uh, again, I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. So that's pretty sweet. How big was the facility at that time? That's uh Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> The, the facility Seagram's had, it was a huge facility. It was one of the show places, actually, you know, they, they kind of wine and dine and people from all over the world for Kentucky Derby and brought them in there. And, and, uh, it, it looked like a, a college campus. I mean, it was, it was really, you know, the hedges were, were preened very nicely and, and all the landscaping was just, it was, it was amazing. Uh, the facility itself, you know, it was an older facility and, and been around. It wasn't the latest technology by any means, but, it was very functional and, and uh, we made some, some good whiskey back in those days. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. That's crazy. So from there, um, where did you move after Seagram's? So after there, when they shut down, I, I had an opportunity to relocate with them. I would have wound up in New York city at the corporate Ooh. offices. And, uh, at that time I really wasn't ready to, to move. So I accepted the severance package. They, I got my MBA in uh, one year's time and, and, uh, at Bellarmine University in Louisville, and, and they paid for every penny of it. So that was that was a great opportunity. But I went to work for Brown Foreman shortly thereafter. And, okay. uh, you know, I, again, Brown Foreman was great. I started out as uh, uh, the bottling manager for their second shift and uh, managed their bottling operation. Uh, did that for a little over a year, got promoted uh, and was in charge of all the, the dry goods, all the bottles, uh, the, you know, the boxes, the labels, everything coming in for the bottling operation. Then I also uh, picked up another uh, addition promotion and added all the wet goods. So basically, I was responsible for everything coming in from, you know, tank trucks out of Canadian mist, uh, you know, out of Collingwood, Canada, come down for to bottle Canadian mist, uh, Pepe Lopez tequila coming up from Mexico, uh, all the the early times warehouse, which is right down the street from the the, uh, the main facility there in Lowell. Um, but so I was with Brown Foreman for a total of, of 12 years, but nine of those 12 years, um, after I got done downtown at the bottling operation, I got promoted out to the Cooperage. And okay. so, uh, I actually was, uh, managed the Cooperage operations for, uh, for a little over nine years. 
And, and that was great. A lot of people thought, man, why, why do you want to go out to that hellhole? It's hot. It's nasty. It's smoky and dirty. And I said, you know, that's an element. I, I've learned how to make good whiskey. Uh, the barrel is so critical to the final product. It, you know, people don't realize 60 to 70 percent of the flavor in a finished bottle of whiskey comes from that, that white oak, charred white oak barrel. So, um, so it, it was, again, it was a, another great training ground and, and gave me some exposure that I didn't have uh, and experienced a, an area I didn't have. Most people don't. Um, and that's an area now that I'm very proud of as a master distiller that uh, most master distillers ne never had that opportunity. So, uh, and it means a lot to the finished product. Yeah, that's crazy. I, it, it is kind of cool, especially, I mean, because Jack Daniels has, has always been like a Goliath of the industry, but now like their single barrel products are taking off like a like a huge runway you know it's it's interesting to see them as a brand realize and start to market like jack daniel's single barrel barrel proof is a big favorite of mine and it's you know it's kind of cool to see that that's becoming a hallmark of their portfolio besides you know number seven too which is at least personally is neat so you moved so you were at brown foreman for 12 years that's i mean that's a pretty good tenure um and then did you move to austin nichols after that or yeah Opportunity, you know, it's, it's funny how uh, corporate politics uh, kind of get in the way of, of uh, uh, doing the right things. And, and so anyhow, um, it gave me an opportunity. Some things came up that uh, uh, some promises made that, that weren't, weren't kept. And, and so it, it caused me to start looking at other opportunities. And, you know, I, I had recruiters calling me every week and okay. I got the thanks for no thanks. And so finally I said, you know, yeah, sure. I listen. What you got? And uh, this opportunity came up at, uh, at the Wild Turkey facility with Austin Nichols. And so I, I said, yeah, we'll talk. And so I talked to a recruiter. And, and next thing you know, I got an interview and, and got the job. But I was uh, basically the vice president of Austin Nichols and a managing director at the Wild Turkey Distillery. So, uh, But I, I was there for when Pernod Ricard owned the facility. I, I was there a little over 10 years. So, Wow. Uh, yeah, a great opportunity, you know. Um, you know, Jimmy Russell, Eddie Russell worked for me for that time period. And, and, uh, there, there's nobody better in this industry than Jimmy Russell. Jimmy's, uh, he's one of the, the, the one, he's probably the last of the true Mohicans when it comes to, uh, true master distillers that grew up with corn dust under their fingernails. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's cool to hear that from someone, you know, that's, that's as long standing as you are in the industry. Cause like a lot of us feel that we are like, man, this Jimmy guy, like Jimmy just rocks. Like every time I talk to Jimmy, every time Jimmy's doing something, I'm like, man, you know, this, this guy's super cool. And it, you know, it's kind of cool to see that reflected, you know, from his peers as well. Cause it's not every day we get to talk to people who worked above Jimmy, you know, now it's owned by Campari. And like, if you try and get anyone above Jimmy, you know, you just get some automated reply. It's very Campari ish, but. Yeah. You know, it, it, in those days, I mean, it was, it, we, we had a lot of fun. I mean, not, not just Jimmy, but you know, Booker, no. And, and, uh, oh, man, yeah. Elmer T. Lee and Parker Beam. I mean, you know, these are all good, close friends. I mean, again, this industry, especially on the operations side, it's very close knit. You know, we, we look out for each other. And and if, uh, you know, I tell people if if we had a motor burnout and we didn't have a spare, I probably, I could pick up the phone and I could call any one of the distilleries around us. And if they had that motor, they'd either throw it in the truck and bring it to us or vice versa. We'd help them out. And we did that all the time. Now you get in the sales and marketing side it was a little more competitive i mean we we're still competitors but we helped each other out and we looked after each other but you know like i said booker and, and jimmy and and uh, parker and elmer and, and uh, you know there's there's many more but uh, those guys kind of you know laid, laid the, the groundwork for what you're seeing today in this industry some some great whiskey oh man that's cool yeah it, and it's cool to hear too because like like we live in the age of like where you, you know every every bottle has a story on the side and you don't know how true it is or you know it, everything's marketing fluff so it's like it's super cool to to realize that you know everyone was super close tight knit back then and it was you know not a big family but every you know everyone was buds and was into just making whiskey and stuff yeah, it definitely was for sure so tell us a little bit. So you hinted that you, you, you started the Russell's brand and, and we'll get drinking some chicken cock whiskey here in a minute. But as, as I mean, like it was, I think it was a year and a half, two years ago. I was like, Hey, these Russell's barrels are kind of cool. Why don't I try like 50 of them? And me and like five people got like 50 of these barrels together and just tried a bunch of them and had a big party with it. And I was like, all right, you know, this Russell stuff's pretty cool. You know, we should pay attention to that going forward. So like, you know, so that was your brainchild, huh? So, yeah. So let me explain how that happened. Actually, when, when I started uh, with uh, Pernod Ricard in, in, in that, that role, 
as managing director in uh, uh, it was the end of March 1998, I guess. And, and right away, they said, you know, we need you to take a look at our inventory. We think we have too much whiskey. And I said, okay, well, I can do that, but I need to know what your sales forecast is, you know, extend it out. And so they said, well, we'll figure it 2% growth on every brand, on every item, every wild turkey item, um, out for three years. I said, well, that's fine, but I need to know out to 12 years because you got, you know, you got some 12 year old whiskey that you're selling on the international market. And, and I need to know out 12 years, which, which each brand, whether it's a 12 year, eight year, the rare breed, the Kentucky spirit, you know, the 101, the 80 proof, whatever. I need to know each one. They said, well, just figure all 2% growth out for 12 years. So <laughs> I built a pretty simple uh, Excel spreadsheet. It's a liquidation distillation model, I call it. And, uh, and so when I got done, I plugged in the numbers and took the inventory and, and showed them. I said, well, I said, the fact is you don't have too much whiskey, but you got too much older whiskey. At that time, their finance department at the corporate office in New York City was the ones dictating which barrels they were going to pull to dump. And of course, Wild Turkey 101 was probably 75% or more of, of the volume that they, they bottled every year. And so at that time, it was six and a half year old whiskey. And what they would do is that uh, if it was older, they would only use six and a half year old whiskey. Well, that's fine. You know, six and a half, seven, eight years ago, when you laid it down and, and barreled it, they were barreling more than what we were bottling at that time. And so they had an excess and it kept getting older and older. Well, if you got another year older, they wouldn't because it's, you know, well, that's, that's too expensive now. You know, it's, it's uh, more evaporation and another years of avalorum taxes. And so financially, you know, looking focus strictly on the, the finances of this. Well, we can't use that. It's too expensive. Well, you know what? And I finally told him, I said, look, you got too much. So they said, well, what can we do? I said, well, first off, you got to bite the bullet. You have got to use some of that older whiskey. Right. Uh, and now, you blend it with the six and a half year old, but, but not in such high percentages that, that you change it dramatically change the taste profile. And so everything, I mean, whether it was 80 proof 101, I mean, they, they, we adjusted the formulations to use up some of the older whiskey. I said, the second option is you can try to sell mature whiskey. Now at that time in the late nineties, 1990s, nobody was buying age. That was whiskey. tough. There was just yeah. no market. Not, totally unlike it is today. Um, so, uh, and, and so I said, the third option is we can come up and create a new brand. Well, okay. Well, you know, what, what should we do? I said, well, I said, it's high time. This company paid tribute to one of the greatest master distillers this, this world's ever seen. And that's Jimmy Russell. He said, yeah, that's kind of cool. I said, well, <laughs> what do you call it? Said, well, for lack of a better term, how about if we call it Russell's reserve? I said, that's kind of got a nice ring to it. And, and the marketing guys like this. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's great. The problem was we, we had some 10 year old whiskey and, and I'll, I'll get into that, but you know, they came out and they wanted to hit a price niche between rare breed, which at the time oh. was around 32, $34 and one one, which is around $19. And so they came out with a 25, a 24 99 bottle. I mean, it was a $40 bottle of whiskey at that time, back in the late 1990s that they were selling for, for less than, you know, $25. So, um, but anyhow, Jimmy didn't know any of this. I mean, he, he was totally, uh, you know, uh, oblivious to what was going on. So one day I said, Jimmy, I said, you know, we got some great whiskey up there on the fourth floor of B Warehouse. I said, why, why don't you go up and, and pull a sample and let's let's check it out. We're, we're thinking about maybe coming out with a new brand. And so I had a meeting with the union that, that day and, and we were wrapping up and heard a knock on the door and Jimmy comes in and you know, he, he's got a little, you know, Glenn Karen, a little snifter glass like this. And, and he says, he says, Greg, here's that bourbon you wanted to sample. So I said, well, yeah, let's just take a look at it. And I mean, I, I got it about a foot from my face. And man, the caramel and vanilla about knocked my head off. I said, whoa. <laughs> and, and you have to know Jimmy. Jimmy wouldn't cuss if he had a mouthful, but he he just give me that little grin and yeah, that's pretty good <laughs> stuff, you know. And so I said, wow, this is fantastic. So, and again, he still didn't know, but um, later on when, when uh, uh, the brand rolled out and, and we kind of had a little, uh, uh, celebration, uh, uh, you know, promoting Russell's Reserve, and, and Jimmy shed a few tears over it, but uh, it was great because he's, he's a great guy. And and at that time, it actually it was it was in the old standard tall Wild Turkey 101 bottle, basically the standard whiskey okay. bottle. Wild Turkey no it was 101 proof as well when we started out with it. Nowadays, the the standard 10 year old I think is 90 proof still. So, Mark, yeah, a little bit. So, 
it's really ironic. You, you guys keep talking about stuff that I have just with an arm's reach. That's, that's what I was yeah, warming up with tonight. Yeah. Yeah. 90 proof. Yeah. Man, that's neat. That I mean, yeah. Russell's, I mean, to, to us is, is very much just like a daily phrase. Like I, I can't remember a day that's gone by that I haven't talked with someone about Russell's reserves. So that's, that's pretty fucking cool. Well, yeah. hopefully here in a couple of years, Jay, we'll, we'll have some uh, some whiskey available that you can come down and do do a pick as well with the, with the chicken cock. So. Yeah, I mean that'd be awesome. It, that'd be awesome. You know the our bourbon is. You know we've got. I think tomorrow is actually if the math checks out tomorrow we'll hit one hundred and forty five thousand participants. So it's wow, it's a big family of people who like bourbon. So that'd be sure. that'd be super cool. And a lot that's of a, that's a geeks. perfect transition too. Yeah, for. Those of you that haven't seen Greg's long profile or any of the tickers, yeah, he's here with um, Chicken Cock Whiskey, which we actually have a little bit to taste as well. So maybe uh, maybe we should chat about that a little bit. Yeah, let's dig in. Sure. We have the straight bourbon and the straight rye, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. So tell we'll us a little bit about Chicken Cock Whiskey. I know. Okay, so very yeah, you know, uh, you know, people always say, well, man, why'd you come up with that name? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, I didn't come up with that name. That, the brand originated in 1856 in Paris, Kentucky. So it's an old, old mm -hmm. brand, old Kentucky brand. And, uh, you know, people need to realize back in 1856, you know, uh, American culture, we were still using old language. Okay. And in old English, a, a male chicken was called a cock. So it was yep. chicken cock whiskey. James A. Miller, who started the distillery and started the brand, um, called it chicken cock whiskey. The term rooster didn't really come around until the late 1800s, early 1900s. And it was actually uh, driven by the Puritan sect that uh, uh, you know, decided that, the, you know, the, the term uh, cock was started taking on some sexual connotations. And so the Puritan uh, sect decided, well, let's let's come up with a different term. And so that's when when rooster actually uh, okay. became a, a term for, for a male chicken. So. Uh, but, okay. but then, yeah, it's an old brand and, and it has a lot of history, uh, pre prohibition. Um, you know, come prohibition, uh, like many distilleries, it had to shut down because they didn't have the funds to, to acquire a medicinal alcohol permit. Okay, and, and the brand sold to a company up in, in Montreal, Canada. Uh, and of course, they were making rye whiskey at that time, and, and so they, they made this rye whiskey, put it in the bottle under the chicken cock label. And uh, they would put it in a tin can because that tin can protected it better when they would bootleg it across the border back into the U.S. <laughs> and so, nice. um, but actually, uh, Chicken Cock, one of its, its probably its biggest claim to fame was it was the house whiskey at the Cotton Club, which is probably the most famous speakeasy uh, yeah. during the, the Roaring Twenties, uh, during the Prohibition uh, in Harlem, New York. And so uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, history, a lot of literature, you know, articles written and so forth and uh duke ellington and, and count basie and, and, uh, and louis armstrong a lot, a lot of the the uh the old time uh, uh musicians and, and and entertainers uh spoke of it all the time but um before prohibition ended the brand was reacquired by a company that was a subsidiary of national distillers and uh, they had a medicinal alcohol per, uh, permit so they started the story back up and actually started producing chicken cock uh, as a medicinal alcohol. Um, if you ever get to Kentucky, in Bardstown, Kentucky, there's a museum called the Oscar Getz Museum. They have the entire history of, uh, of Kentucky, or Kentucky whiskey, Kentucky bourbon. And there's a lot of those bottles, old bottles, and there's a lot of old chicken cock bottles of pre-prohibition during the prohibition era. And, and they have some of the old medicinal alcohol. They have some prior to prohibition, but they also have some of the bottles on display of the medicinal alcohol as well. So. Um, you know, prohibition was repealed uh, in, in 1933, and so uh, the brand did well. It grew, and and up until about I think it was the 1950s, the distillery burnt down, and so at that oh. time the the company decided not to rebuild it, and and, and the brand just sat idle. Um, you know, it was a registered brand uh, with with the U.S. government, but the brand sat idle, and so around 2011, uh, Marty Antle, the founder of Grain and Barrel Spirits. Uh, you know, was reading up, doing a lot of research, and he found the brand and and acquired the brand, and and so, you know, his his vision was to, to eventually resurrect it back to Kentucky, and so in in 2017, I decided to get out of the corporate rat race and, and uh, uh, ramp up my retirement plan, and that was not to retire, but start my own consulting company, 
And so Perfect. when I started consulting, uh, you know, Marty was one of the first people I met and, and uh, I was helping him with the supply chain for um, another brand they have called, they have Dixie Vodka is, is another good brand of theirs. Uh, but uh, eventually uh, I helped him negotiate a contract uh, with uh, Bardstown Bourbon Company. And that's actually where we're making our, our, our whiskey today. Uh, oh, okay. You familiar with Bardstown Bourbon Company? I am. Yeah, yeah they have a couple of cool releases and we actually, we have a couple of barrels that are, are sleeping yeah. there for a while. Great company, great people. I've, I've uh, Steve Nally, uh, who's one of the few people that have been in the industry longer than I have. He's been <laughs> a couple of years on me, but, uh, uh, but I've known Steve for a long, long time. He, and again, and a great, another great master distiller and, and, uh, you know, he helped that company get started. And so anyhow, I reached out to them and, and it, it's a great, they have a collaboration program where we use their facility, their employees, and basically I gave them a mash bill. You know, our mash bill for our, our chicken cock is, is 70% corn, 21% rye, and 9% malted barley. Okay. And so uh, likewise, I gave them all the work instructions as far as the time and the temperatures for cooking, you know, the specifications for fermentation and distillation. Um, and, and basically I, I select the barrels as well. So then when they make our whiskey, I go down there and oversee the process and get them going with the first few batches to make sure they're they're uh, on track with our specifications. So it, it's a great collaboration. They, they've got a, a great crew down there and they're making some fantastic whiskey. So, Oh, that's cool. Yeah, we were, okay, that, that answers a question. We were hypothesizing where yeah. uh, where you guys might be working out of and, and Bardstown was not a guess. That's pretty cool. They've, I mean, they're, they're doing just about everything, including the kitchen sink there between their own releases and, and contract releases and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. Yeah, you know, it's one of those places that, you know, there's a number of distilleries doing contract distillation, yeah. but it's different. This is collaborative distillation, okay? They actually let you, you know, basically call the shots. Contract okay. distillation, you know, distilleries make whiskey and, and you can buy it. Okay? Sure. That's not the way this works. You, you actually have a say-so in every step of the process uh, from start to finish and, and again. Like I said, they're great people to work with. They're, they're doing a fantastic job, and I can't wait to, to see that whiskey become of age. We, we, did, we laid down the first 600-plus barrels in August oh, wow. of 2018, so it's a little, little over um, a little over two years old. I just sampled it, and it's progressing very nicely. We've got another 600 that we laid down in February 2019, so it's 18 months old now. And, uh, and then the last laid down we, we put down in March, so actually this week, uh, it actually turned six months. So I'll be going down probably in the next week or two to, to sample it. I, I try to sample our whiskeys every six months. Uh, okay. they, so, uh, but this last one was unique. You know, I was telling you about the, the Cooperage experience that I had, um, you know, through my consulting services, I, I, one of my other clients is a company called West Virginia Great Barrel Company. New okay. company started making barrels. I helped them get their company started. Um, but through that relationship i went out there a year ago this past may and i personally selected the logs that we use to cut the staves and heading uh, we we air dried them for about 10 a little over 10 months and then i was out there to oversee the barrel process making the barrels the toasting make sure they toast them properly charred them properly and then of course we made the the bourbon and, and filled those same barrels so it's kind of neat as we say it was from bark to, to barrel to, to <laughs> bourbon to bottle, yeah, seriously. You know? That's yeah. about as hands-on as it gets. Yeah, so it, it's kind of kind of unique. I don't know of any other company, any other master distiller that, that has that uh, uh, that experience uh, of, of working in the cooperage as well. And and uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see because these these every one of these logs was very very tight grain. Okay, and, I was going to ask what what were you looking for in the logs if you were going yeah, that you know that it's deep? typical standard tight grain Jay is is about uh, ten annual growth rings per inch. Okay. Well, West Virginia, that's all Appalachian. I'll let white oaks coming out of the Appalachian mountains, okay? And that soil is rough and rocky. Now, the fact they're in some pretty tall, steep mountains, you know, 50% of the trees are on a, a north-facing slope, so they don't get much sunlight to begin with. So they're going to they're gonna naturally grow slow just for that fact. But the, the soil in that area is just so rough and rocky that, that there's an extremely high percentage of very tight grain oak. So why is tight grain important? Well, those most of those trees are averaging somewhere between 12 to 15 annual growth rings per inch. 
white oak, one of the reasons white oak is used, there, there's three, three primary components. There's cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. Cellulose is basically the, the cellular structure that, that's, that makes the wood strong and holds it together. The hemicellulose is where the polysaccharides are, the wood sugars. So it's just like when you build that barrel and you toast it, just like holding sugar in a spoon and holding it over a Bunsen burner. You know, what, what's that sugar do? It starts melting and caramelizing on you. Okay. That's where that caramel flavors are coming from uh, in, in the whiskey. Likewise, the lignin, the third component, lignin. When you heat up that barrel, it converts that lignin into vanillin, which is where the vanilla flavors come from. And you remember earlier I said 60 to 70 percent of the flavor in a finished bottle of whiskey comes from that white oak barrel. Well, that's that's the primary components that are they're creating those, those great flavors. And so when you got tight grain, you've got such a high concentration and high density of those components that are available in the wood to convert into all those great flavors. When, when you look at a, a standard 53 gallon barrel and along the builds, the belly of the barrel, you got 81 inches in circumference around that barrel. Okay. 12 to 15 annual growth rings average. When you look at that 81 inches, you're looking at anywhere from, you know, 970 to over a thousand years of annual growth in one barrel. Wow. <laughs> and that, that's, I'm just trying to put it in perspective, the density and the concentration of the flavors that are available. And so sure. when you toast it properly and char it properly, man, it, it's, I, I, I'm excited. I just can't wait. <laughs> uh, it's going to be at least 2024, unfortunately, until, until that whiskey becomes of age. But Right. Uh, yeah. So does that translate to a longer aging time with that? Uh, it, more it dense actually you should get more of that flavor earlier earlier up front yeah uh i still want to keep some longer because you know I, to me you know six to, to 12 years is kind of the sweet spot depending on where it was aged in the warehouse but uh, uh we're going to bottle some at four years old because i think it's going to it's going to be comparable to, to many other older whiskeys at that point in time just because we toasted it properly when you toast it and you don't char it right away, you just toast it. And you, so what you're doing is you're creating those flavors, like, you know, like bacon brownies. You know, you, you're creating those flavors and you're driving it deep into the wood so that when you do char it, you don't burn all those flavors away. We use okay. a number three level char. We don't use a lot of companies use a number four, which is the heaviest char. Yeah, right. but if you use a number four. You know, you create all those flavors and you burn them and, and you know you waste them. So you want to create it and you just want to char it just enough to kind of fracture the surface so that whiskey can actually penetrate through that char layer. And the char actually works like a charcoal filter. It's you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's where it gets its color and, and all the flavor. No, that creates like a charcoal filter. When you taste whiskey off the still, I mean, it. you can taste the corn and the rye and the multiple. You, you can taste the grain. And that's what you want. You want that going into the barrel. But through the, the maturation, as it, that whiskey drives into the wood and back out and in the wood and back out, that charcoal filtering strips that graininess out, and that's where it's picking up the caramel and vanilla and, and sweeter components inside the wood. So, again, I, I don't mean to get on a, on a tire seminar here. No, we man. Can go all night on man, I want to go down that rabbit hole again, man. Yeah, I want to that's talk super about cool. That later. Well, uh, it's funny because, like, a lot of us just sit around and, like, I mean, we all work from home now, obviously. So, we all chat online and we're like talking about like weird wood and stuff. So, it it's super cool. I mean, you know, sometimes we wonder, like, do companies even care that much? Like, maybe we're just reading too much into it. But, like, yeah, right. Does honestly, anybody your passion for wood is, about this? yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that is, I immediately started cool. thinking of stuff like the uh, the French oak finishes you see on some whiskeys and things like that because of that different type of grain and the different type oh, of yeah. oak and the, the layers of flavor that you may or may not pull out of something just from, you know, just in a different region, let alone a, a whole different style of wood. So, uh, yeah. You could count me uh, in as interested to see how that project goes. Cool. Yeah, I joined that TED talk. Yep. Well, yeah, we're, we're like I said, hopefully we'll, we'll have an opportunity here to do some barrel picks uh, down the road as that that starts to evolve and and uh, uh, you know get some 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 character closer to its its full maturation. But uh, um, in the meantime, part of my my function is to go out and and try to to find good quality whiskey that we can put under the the chicken cock label and, and bridge that gap until okay. our is, is a proper age. And so that's kind of what I've been doing here the last, last three years. And, and uh, luckily we've been, we've been fairly successful. It, it's difficult. I mean, we were talking earlier in the late 1990s, you know, you couldn't give aged whiskey away. There's just nobody was mm -hmm. looking for it. But today, man, it's tough to find. And if, if you do find some good way, I mean, there's whiskey out there, 
but right but not all of it's of the, of the quality level that, that you want to make want to put under your, your label and so to find a, a whiskey that's it's uh, of that quality caliber uh is one thing but then to be able to afford it <laughs> and yeah. uh, put it on a bottle right. and, and make a make a profit is, is another thing so uh so yeah so what we're tasting tonight is the chicken cock kentucky straight bourbon whiskey is the first one and unfortunately we i, I believe in being as transparent as i possibly can but we had to sign a non-disclosure on when we acquired this and so i can't really share a whole heck of a lot of information but uh, you guys tell me i mean you, you've had an opportunity to, to nose it and what, what are you what are you picking up yeah, I mean, uh, Jay and I both have actually talked about exactly where we thought it came from. We don't have to go down that road, obviously, but uh, just on the nose, man, this brings a nice layer of vanilla to it. A little bit of like uh, like this. I even hate to say it now because Jay and I pull this note so so <laughs> frequently that we'll end up saying there's two things that come up so much. And one of them is praline, which I pick up on. Oh, this. yeah. So we get yeah. like that, you know, toasted, nutty, caramel, a little bit of background butteriness to it. And then another note, which I'm not really picking up here um, in a lot of products we get is a bananas foster. And I hate having to use either one because we say it so damn much, but it, you know, they're both things that incorporate all of those classic bourbon notes, whether it's caramel, vanilla, a little bit of nuttiness, some oak structure. Like we pull all those things together into, you know, the way our minds shape it. Yeah. And that pretty well, note so. sticks out to me here. Yeah, I can't tell you that this is actually a blend. I mean, it's it's some some old old whiskey, but then some really older whiskey that I blended with it. The 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 the, the primary batch that we, we we were able to acquire, it was missing some of the characteristics that I really like. And luckily, we had some pretty old stuff that uh, we still had in inventory. And so okay. I did some blending with it, and uh, I really think it, it it balanced it out nicely and, and uh, gave us a gave us a, the profile we were looking for. It comes yeah. through really nicely, like on the nose. It I was like, oh, this this is a little more youthful. But once it hits your palate, like I get like a rice crispy, um, like an apple crisp, and like there is some nice oak structure, even though it's oh, yeah. know, kind of like sixty percent ABV, where you get that big syrupy mouthfeel. But the oak is is definitely there, and it's it's pulling its weight for sure. Yeah, now this is ninety proof. I think we touched on that earlier uh, yeah. before the podcast. But yeah, this is uh, this is uh, ninety proof. Both expressions of rye as well as ninety proof. So. Okay. And again, that's one of those things that I experimented with with different different proof levels, and you know, it's you've got X amount of whiskey. You want to try to to maximize your profitability, but by the same token, you want to put something in the bottle that's worthy of, of the price point that it's selling under. Number one, and and you want to you know repeat sales. So right, you don't want to buy one bottle and run it away. You don't over dilute it. You, you want to knock it down to where that, that alcohol burn kind of subsides. And then the, you know, the caramel, the vanilla, the, the phenolic compounds that are desirable kind of overtake the profile. Yeah, this is nice. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still got that Kentucky hug, as I say. You can, you can <laughs> feel it, you know, when you're drinking it neat. But, yeah, uh, yeah. I think but, 45 does it, does it well. You know, the first thing I noticed when places over dilute is that the mouthfeel just like completely vanishes. You yeah, know, it falls right away. And then it can't, um, you know, then you don't coat the palate well enough. You lose everything on the backside there. You don't get any of the spice that comes through. Yeah, this lands very nicely. Yeah, I think this is, yeah, this does a really good job at 90. I mean, no, it's I, a, a classic profile too. So it's really, it's not like it's coming out of left field or something a little bit crazy. You know, oh, this yeah. hits all of the right boxes. Yeah, this is, now we were, we were kind of joking before we started the stream because, both of our states don't carry this. So what's just for the audience here, what's the MSRP on your bourbon and rye? So the, the can expect bourbon, uh, suggested retail price on it, it's like uh, fifty nine ninety nine, so 60 bucks basically. Okay. Yeah. Is that Not the bad. same on the rye as well? Uh, the rye is actually uh, 69 dollars 70 bucks. Okay. Uh, retail. I've seen it less. I've seen it more. It just depends on the market. And, and you're right. right. Unfortunately, we're not into Wisconsin or Maine yet, but uh, – but it's amazing. At the beginning of this year, uh, I think we were selling in 12 states. And right now we're in, I think, 32, maybe 30, 32. Wow. Like that. So okay. we've grown a lot this year. And, and, and you know, the this is not an got, easy year for that either. It, it is. Uh, you know, luckily, uh, we don't do a lot of on premise sales. The off premise is, is booming right now. And as most companies are experiencing, it's a shame that that the on-premise is not and uh, but hopefully uh, we get through this pandemic things will pick up and it'll, it'll catch up but uh yes sir 
Yeah, I mean, that that's a huge jump already. I mean, in Wisconsin's pretty open. Like, I expect, you know, in a couple of years, and if not, we'll just check on down to you. <laughs> well, I know we're up – actually, we're in Indiana now, which is was my home state. Um, mm -hmm. And we're in uh, in Illinois, so we're getting closer to, to Wisconsin. <laughs> okay. I spent your time in Illinois. Illinois. And we are in New Hampshire as well, so we're, we're creeping our way up there towards Maine. Yeah, man. All right, so we'll we have road trip too. availability. We there you go. Available right. on a road trip. Within striking distance is usually good enough <laughs> to get going. It's a good way to start. Striking distance. Yeah, and, and the finish on this is pretty nice too. Like for 45%, like you said, it's got the Kentucky hug. Like there's a little yeah, bit of heat, on. but it's not punishing. Um, yep. I honestly, I think this would hold up well. I'm not a big cocktail guy, most because I'm lazy. But, you know, I think this would, would honestly work pretty well in an old-fashioned if, you know, if, with – the ABV being what it is and the oak being there, I think that this would probably hold up pretty well. I'm, yeah, yeah primarily yeah, neat. Absolutely right, Jay. I, same here. I, I like my neat or on the rocks, but I'm telling you what, it, it, I've had a couple old fashions with it and it, it, it's fantastic. That's awesome. I might have to give that a shot maybe this weekend. I'm trying to think. I, yeah, I could see that with, uh, you know, I pretty much say this every time though. So it's not even <laughs> almost. It's almost just dumb to say, but I, I could see it with the black walnut bitters in there too for an old fashion. Oh, yeah. I would really. You do that like do the black walnut. Me. I do. Super messed up. That I, that's all the every time I have something, I'm thinking of a cocktail. I'm like, man, this would go good to some black walnut bitters. Don't you think so? <laughs> I like I do picture you like at like lunch with like a glass of ice water and being like black walnut bitters? Question mark. You'd probably go really good in this, right? <laughs> 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 Which is disgusting. Well, I am that. Cool, yeah. So the bourbon, uh, I what have do many you things. Of? <laughs> disgusting is just one of them man eh, it's okay I'm yeah so i this rye i think yeah i just picked up the rye i was gonna say holy cow we uh we'll catch on i, I i'm thinking of a note john and, and since you you mentioned the telemetry i'm curious to see if you'll you'll pick up what i'm picking up not to like put you immediately on the spot but we were talking about this maybe it was last week's stream but i it was pretty unique but i think you'll get it so now I'm trying to think of what you're talking about <laughs> instead of thinking about what it's like. I don't know. For me, this is going. I mean, obviously, uh, it's got a good, good chunk of rye to it, but it's it's more of a Kentucky style rye for me. Sure. You know, it's got a, a little bit heavier layer of caramel than I would have thought it would for. What, what's the match on this, Greg? Is it ninety five five? I think it's, it's ninety five five. Right? Yeah, it's you know I yeah. I, I tell people I for years I, I was not a big fan of rye. Okay. And, and when I was at Wild Turkey, I mean, Wild Turkey, we, we made a rye, um, didn't make a lot of it, but but it was like 30 some odd percent corn. And it just it had a harshness to us. It just didn't fit well with my palate. But some of these 95 fives that are out there now, uh, when I started looking for, for rye that we could put under the chicken cock label, uh, man, I, I, have, I have tasted some fabulous ryes. I couldn't believe it. And, and 95 five, I think is a trick. And so, this is actually, I can be, be transparent. This was actually, uh, this rye came from Bardstown Bourbon Company. This okay. Part of the collaboration. No yeah. Um, and when I first knows it, and again, you know, I, I try to block out age statements, okay? I'm right. looking, when I go out and, and I'm trying to source whiskey, I'm looking for something that really, you know, has the right nose, has the right taste, and that that is of the quality level that, that we want under the chicken cock label. And so when, when I sampled rise, this one just, I mean, I, I thought it was fantastic. I think the, the nose is, is full of spice and you got some peppery notes in there that uh, fantastic. You know, I've done so many different podcasts over the last few months. Cause some people pick up dill. Okay. I, yeah. You know, maybe a little bit, but, um, and, and that's what I tell people, you know, there is no right or wrong answer when you're doing a tasting. Sure. Uh, everybody's nose, everybody's palate is different. So, you know, what, what you pick up is maybe it's something totally different than what I pick up. But uh, at the end of the day, if you like it, drink it. You know, I just, uh, but sure. I, again, I, I like to, I like to grill out. I, I've got a green, big green egg and I, I do a lot of smoking on it. And yeah, so man. one of the dry rubs I use, it's got paprika, it's got some cumin in it. And I, I pick those notes up in this rye. I mean, I get some paprika, I get some of the cumin notes and some of the spiciness of it. So, yeah, That's I get a interesting you mentioned that. that. Cause I was going to say peach rings, smoked paprika, um, and then like a, like a heavy molasses clove. But, uh, I had, I think it was, it was Woodford wheat, like 
wheat last oh, week. Oh man, you ago. love those peach rings. And I was like, man, this smells like peach rings. And John was like, motherfucker, what? <laughs> I was like, peach rings. Like, come on, like. Man, this, this is good. Like a big hit of like a wildflower honey too. Mm, yeah. I really dig that. That that's a that hits me just right. Yeah, yeah this, I really like that. You're right though, I, I I get that as well. I get a little bit of that, that wildflower honey. Yeah, man. It's, it's funny you mentioned the rich. age statements too. Um, because like when we do selections, like I, I tell people, like you can be involved. I'm just never gonna tell you what it is. And people always pick the youngest. Like we had four, five, and six year old smooth ambler, and the two picks that one were on the younger side. And every yep. time once you blind out the age statements, people think they like older, but once they let their palette guide, it's rarely the oldest in the bunch, if ever, like by an overwhelming margin. I think oh, it's yeah. super yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah. This is nice. Yeah, there's some nice white fruit in there. It's almost like a white grape. Yeah, just, just a little bit. I'm gonna but clean man. my peach rings, but this is this is yeah. Nice. You, you take you take your peach rings. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Jay, you mentioned earlier old fashioned, I, and I'm telling you what, make an old fashioned with this rye. Oh my god, it is out of this world. Again, I'm not a big cocktail guy either. Uh, yeah, but occasionally I, I like a Manhattan or an old fashioned, but this rye makes a, a fabulous old fashioned. I'll take your advice. I got some of the sample left. I'll uh, I'll whip one up. I'm yeah, just I'm starting look. to pack for a move, and so like most of my whiskey's in storage anyway. So I've been like getting creative with what hasn't been packed yet. Like this random Russell's I pulled out. Yep, perfect. This yeah. would be good. This like has enough bite too to like, you know, the 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 sweetness of the old fashioned, also the bitters. Like I feel like it could stand up very well to both of those components. Yeah. Which yeah. sometimes like the first thing to get lost is the whiskey, which I don't right. think would be the case at all. No, this is a really good rye structure, man. Ooh. I like how it's got that much richer profile. Like a lot of times with the 95.5s, like if you look at things like the bullet stuff, mm -hmm. it's very, very classic and very good. But it's also in that same way, kind of like two-dimensional. There's not like a real deep layer of flavor to it. It checks off all the boxes, but it doesn't really go much further. But I like this just goes one layer deeper on that rich note and i do like that quite a bit that fruit honey spice all kind of works together just right you know i wouldn't black walnut this one i think i'd put orange bitters in it <laughs> well hell is frozen over we found yeah, something like tell me about it. black walnut <laughs> it's nice so it, it's on the fruitier side which yeah. is, is rare for rye that i enjoy but this is well, especially a, at that 95 yeah i, I know, do if this was like a kentucky experiment. like a you know, like wild turkey rye at that 52%. There's tons of citrus in there and stuff like rare breed rye. It, for me, it was like yeah. Fruit Loops and, you know, white pepper and black pepper all rolled up into one. But this is, man, this is uh, fruity and sweet in all the right ways, man. That's good. Yeah. Now, can you say, are these filtered, unfiltered, somewhere in between? Uh, these these are filtered, but they're not chill filtered, okay? okay. Um, we're not doing any chill filtration whatsoever. And again, you know... Um, 90 proof it's it's you know especially if it's going up to maine or wisconsin you know it had, it's gonna had, be cold <laughs> you know the, the potential for, for hitting some cold climates and, and you know people sure. don't realize what chill filtration does when, when chill fill a lot of whiskeys nowadays if it's less than 100 proof uh oh, what yeah. happens is, is it sits in the in the barrel you know and there's fatty acids that that are in that that wood and, and get into the whiskey and so if you don't chill filter it and you just you know filter it and bottle it and say it goes up through cold climate in the winter time, that cold temperature, those fatty acids coagulate, and and they they, they get uh, create flocculation. So it's flocking inside the whiskey. So so you'll see a, a bottle of whiskey and you see this stuff just floating around in it. You know, you shake it up, it'll dissipate, but it'll flock right back. And that's those fatty acids that have coagulated because of the cold temperatures. By chill filtering, what you do is you you take the whiskey before you bottle it and you you get it below freezing temperature and then you filter it you know you 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 coagulate all those fatty acids and you filter yep. them out and it, unfortunately what that does it strips a lot of the color and a lot of the flavor out right and so if you, you can you know afford to sell it unchill filtered man you're going to get a lot more flavor and so forth so, so all of our products are unchill filtered right now Okay, that's yeah, great. I, I was like noticing, I was like, wow, this actually has pretty good mouthfeel for not being, you know, some yeah. Gonzo ABV. Yeah, and that's yeah, like, it got that little that unfiltered. Yeah. It's got some good weight to it. Yeah, this, I noticed it more on the rye, the butter it is, but it is there for sure. Yeah, certainly. 
Man, that's nice stuff. Absolutely. And especially at a Bardstown Bourbon Company. I have, admittedly, I've had a bunch of their rye, but not, like, I haven't had tons and tons and tons of it. So this this was going under my radar for being Bardstown. But Well, believe it or not, and people, you know, it says it on, on the the, um, the label, the back label. This is uh, this was a little bit less than two and a half years old when it was done. Wow. Okay. No yeah. kidding. Wow. And that's why I said when I go looking at stuff, I don't look at the age per se. I'm just focusing on, on the aromas and the flavors and that. And yep. when people taste that, and then I tell them later on, because you know if it's less than four years old, you got to put put the age sure. on on the uh, but on the back label. If you look right by the UPC on the back label, it says you know aged uh, uh, two years or, or something along those lines, twenty four months or whatever. But it's uh, it's amazing for being in a barrel that short period of time. It's picked up some fabulous flavors, and again, that's a tribute to the guys at Bardstown Bourbon Company. Yeah, that's they really must cool. be putting something really good in those barrels to start out with, man, because that came out nice. Yeah, especially at two years. It it's funny because I uh, a couple of my friends got laid off last week, so I I had a bunch of these little minis of Sazerac rye. So I was just handing them out like, hey, you take one, like you take one, and and then I popped you one. Get rye. Like, yeah, you everyone get gets rye. rye in it. Um, thinking about this, this reminds me of that Sazerac rye profile, but that's six years. So this is right. getting close at a third of that age is, is actually kind of shocking to me. Yeah. A few more proof points doesn't hurt it either. No, not at all. That's yeah. nice stuff. Is there, is there plans to let this continue to age a bunch more? You're going to keep doing on the younger side for a while or are you no, going for like an right eight year old? Still sourcing, you know, we're probably going to be shooting around the same time frame. I mean, it's got such a great, uh, uh profile that i think we're going to continue with it uh we're actually laying down some rye this coming year uh we're actually doubling we you know we've been laying down 600 barrels every year this year we're going to do 1200 uh probably 200 of that's going to be rye and, and the other thousand is going to be uh going to be bourbon so you know there, there's big things planned ahead i think you know what we're doing with the barrels you know i'm, I'm going back out i was out there in may and june of this year uh selecting logs again for what we're going to produce here in, in January, February, March, in that time frame in the first quarter of, of 2021, um, you know, for the barrels that, that, that that's going to be aged in. So again, it, it's an ongoing process. It's something unique that people aren't doing. And and I'm excited as, as heck to, to see the, the results because I've I said everywhere I've worked and, you know, it was, it was kind of a, uh, there was a purpose in my career to get me to where I am today and, and provide the opportunity to, to do something unique and I think something that the, the the whiskey industry and the whiskey world, the whiskey lovers are going to truly enjoy. Man, that's cool. Yeah, 12. I mean, that's even a big jump. I was surprised you guys were doing 600 the last couple of years, but doubling up to 1,200. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. You got a lot of whiskey coming online. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's <laughs> pe people got to understand, you know, you're going to get in the whiskey business. You better be patient. You better have lots of money. So I know, right? Yeah, really. That's People often ask me too, because I mean, and they'll be like, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm interested, um, you know, I'm interested. Like, I want to open a distillery." And I'm like, "You know, the best way." I was like, "Do you want to have a small fortune?" They're like, of course I do. And I'm like, "All right, well, then you're gonna need a big fortune, and then you can open a <laughs> right. distillery, and then you're gonna exactly. have a small fortune afterwards." That's a good and way. Like, <laughs> like, it can't be that expensive. And I'm like, "Oh, oh, it's expensive." Yeah, you, know, it, 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 it has some very loyal, very dedicated uh, investors, and and uh, you know they believe in the brands and and are are invested in it. So it, that's a good thing. Absolutely, man. Yeah, going back. I definitely the bourbon's nice, but I'm 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 leaning for that rye, which mm -hmm. is atypical for me. I'm not I I typically go for bourbon over rye, but it's a really nice rye. Yeah, Good. I'm chasing that rye, man. I'm gonna be after uh Maine to start looking at this. <laughs> well, you can, you can like spend that. some time in New Hampshire. Yeah, that's cool. So you were uh you were talking about the bottle too. I know we were talking about this in the green room, but I figured I'd give you a chance to show it off before we we pack up yeah. for the night. Yeah. So yeah. So so this this bottle this is uh, this is the the bottle that the the bur that's a bourbon and then the green label. Okay, rye for it, green. Yep. Is the rye. Uh, both these bottles, and then we have another bottle. It's called a Starburst bottle that we do our our limited uh, offerings in. Uh, all these bottles are actually replicas of the pre-prohibition era of chicken cock bottles. You know, chicken cock bottles, this was, I mean, they had a, they weren't the 750 size back then. They were pint bottles actually, but uh, we were able to, to, to build the, the 750 and uh, milliliter uh, replica. Uh, 
the Starburst bottle. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Some of our our, uh, oh. our limited offerings. We you know we did a eight year old single barrel. Okay. Um, in 2016, it was actually the 160th anniversary of Chicken Cock Whiskey, and so we came out with eight year single barrel. And uh, that was before I, I started working with the company. When I started working, I asked the founder, "Let me let me have the last 12 barrels of this." Uh, this whiskey and it was getting close to being 10 years old. So I did a, a chicken cock 10 year old double barrel batch. It was actually two barrels per batch. I, I like single barrel. Uh, my only rub with single barrels, they can be so inconsistent barrel to barrel to barrel. And so I wanted to, to do something special, do something that, that was more consistent, but also uh, maximize the amount of flavor that was available in that whiskey. And so the first thing I did that, you know, they, they ranged from 108 to 115 proof in, in the 12 barrels. And so I started knocking it down a proof point at a time until I hit that proof level where, like I said, I didn't over dilute it. You know, I got that that alcohol burn down to where the, the, the caramel and vanilla kind of overtook the profile. But that product actually for that whiskey was 104 proof. And it was a, it was smoother than the most 90s. There's the other bottle. I'm glad you brought that up. That's <laughs> I finally right. dug it up. I had to put nice. it over everybody's Works. face. But there yeah, it is. No, no. You see it's got the, the, the cap. It's actually got a cork finish on it like, like the other. But that's sure. a, a little jigger cap, you know. Back in the old so days, cool. there, that was a kind of a shot glass that you can screw on the, on the bottle, and um, then they call it a jigger cap. That's pretty cool. And, yeah. So the righteous blonde that you just showed the picture of, that was our latest uh, limited offering. We did a collaboration with uh, uh, Goodwood Brewing Company in Louisville, Kentucky, and our first batch of the Kentucky Straight Bourbon. I gave them six barrels. Uh, empty after he dumped the bourbon out and sent them the barrels and they aged uh, uh, their blonde ale in it and they they got some fabulous beer by the way but uh, they aged their blonde ale in it for about eight weeks when they dumped the beer out I got the barrels back and I put rye whiskey back into it and I would I would check it sample it about every couple of weeks just to see how it was progressing but it was a little over five months and I felt it had saturated all the flavor and it was going to get out of it and it, it's really unique I mean that's you know with these finished, you know, barrel finish, beer barrel finish products. And that this was our second collaboration we did with, with Goodwood. Uh, they're very unique. You know, what you get, you get a lot of that malted barley flavor. Yeah. Right up front and in the nose and that, but the rye, the complexity of the rye really, uh, it was just, I don't know, just the, the flavor was spectacular. For me, I just like putting it in a, in a Glencairn for, for an after dinner drink. You get the sweetness, uh, you get the malted barley, you, you get the, uh, you know, the, 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 the rye flavors, all the spiciness of the rye. And it just, a, it's a nice complexity of all those flavors. Um, but yeah, the, it was kind of a play on words. The, the righteous, if you notice, righteous was spelled R Y E. Yeah. Yeah. O U S. It was kind of to get around a few of the, the uh, governmental laws that you couldn't call it rye whiskey. You could right. call it rye whiskey finished in a beer barrel, but you couldn't call it rye whiskey. So we call it righteous blondes as they had blonde ale in the barrel. Okay previously. So we're looking at doing some more limited time offerings. Uh, uh, we actually have one coming up. We're going to bottle here uh, the 15th of October. We're actually going to bottle it and it's going to be available in Kentucky only, but also Damn. online. If, if you live in a state, uh, you guys, I don't know, can you, can you buy online up in Maine or in Wisconsin? We can at Wisconsin. Okay. Well, we've got actually yeah, I tell people when, when I go out looking for high quality whiskey to source that we can put under the chicken cock label, it's a treasure hunt. Yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes you, you find you know some nice gold coins and some things that are worthy of, of putting under the label. But I, I'm so thrilled we found a gem. I mean, this stuff is is fantastic. And so um 15th of October, we're gonna bottle it, but it's gonna be the chicken cock 15-year-old barrel proof. Um, it's going to be about a, a 114 proof and the flavors are just out of this world. I mean, you know, it's one of those things when, when you, know, you guys have tasted, I'm sure as much bourbon as I have, and, and, you know, they're nice and, you know, you, you can be polite or not be polite. It doesn't matter. But this one, wow. It has that wow factor. It is so good. So well, good. Giddy up. Be okay. interested. Yeah. We'll have to keep that, up. Air up on that one. Okay. <laughs> I'll keep an eye out for that. It, it it's funny. Like we we talk about this off and on, but like I've been holding off on large bourbon purchases because I I close on a house in October, but I close on the fifteenth. So if you put it any day after that, like 
<laughs> and you see like a sus- like a suspiciously large purchase from Wisconsin. Know that well, it's in Wisconsin. Earlier, you know, it's uh, you know finding those rare gems is is one thing. When you find them, to be able to afford them is another thing. So the yeah, the no kidding. Going to be pretty pretty high on this one. So, but I believe uh, it. Anyhow, it's uh, it's fantastic. I'm I'm again. I've I've been blessed in my lifetime to taste some some fabulous whiskeys throughout the world. But you now I'm a bourbon lover, and if if uh, I get a chance to taste a great bourbon. You know, it, it makes my my day, my year, and and uh, this one is is absolutely fabulous. I'm I'm so proud that we're able to put it under the chicken cock label. So, well, that's Excellent. cool, man. Thanks for uh, for sharing that with us. Yeah, <clears throat> cool. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, we're we're coming up about the hour mark here. I know, you know, we'll, you know, we can start to wrap it up. But is there anything you'd like to share with the audience before we, you know, we get our last sips in and we kind of pack it up for the night? No, not necessarily. I think we covered so much already. Uh, Hell yeah, you know, we did. Again, I don't know if anybody had any questions or if you're getting anything uh, f- feed through, but uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, again, I've, I've been very blessed in my lifetime to have an opportunity to work in this industry and uh, been exposed a lot and worked for a lot of great companies and work with a lot of great people. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you can take what, what you learn and take those experiences and a- be able to apply them, to, you know, a product that you can kind of call your own, not necessarily your own, but, uh, you know, part of a, a team effort to, to make this this chicken cock uh, become resurrected and, and, and alive and strong and, and growing again. So that's kind of what we're doing. And, and uh, I think we, we made some pretty good progress. Yeah, I'll say, I mean, I, I really enjoyed trying both of these and it was you know, especially it's great to try stuff that I can't just go down to the store and buy. Like, you know, it's always nice to get stuff in the mail and check it out. But it's mm-hmm. super cool to see, you know, we get a ton of booze here in the States, but we don't get all the booze. And it's kind of cool to just see what's going on in other parts of the country. And, you know, and now we know to keep an eye out for it, especially that 15 year stuff. So that's Definitely. awesome. And, you know, I'm a sucker, too, for any of the old <laughs> brands to get resurrected. Like, even if the story were garbage. If it's like a resurrected brand and it's coming back pre-prohibition to these days, it just like it excites me a little bit in a nerdy way. And I'm always going to kind of like even if I like go into it thinking like, okay, this might be a little bit of a dodgy product, but it's got a kind of a cool story and it's old historic. Like I'm going to want to try it. (laughs) And I I like that uh, what came out of the bottle is good because. You know, the the old timiness to it is fun, but like matching it up with some good whiskey also helps. And some black walnut bitters. Well, yeah, I mean, naturally. <laughs> if you're going to take the time to make a cocktail, you may as well put something good in you it. You got to go for it. Well, Greg, man, it was so awesome to have you. Um, thank you so much for dropping by. Guys, if you're interested in chicken cock whiskey, um, give it a Google, or you can visit the link that John just popped up because that's super handy. Um, like like you said, they're doing tons of cool stuff. Um, they have all sorts of stuff coming out, so definitely give them a look. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll pack it up here and then I'll let John take us home. But I'm Jay from Take That Review. Uh, next week, we'll have some Arb Urban News uh, for new barrels coming out. But you know where to find me. And I think that's it. Hopefully, hopefully everyone's staying healthy and, and staying entertained. But yeah, why don't you take us home, John? Very good. Uh, Greg, thanks again for coming on, man. This is great. Really, really honored to have you come in here and just give us all of this great history, man. Your story is uh, it's something to behold. And it's really cool to share this whiskey with you. My pleasure, guys. I, I really enjoyed it. All righty. So I'm just going to wrap it up here. Uh, John, you can find me at thebourbonfinder.com, Instagram at thebourbonfinder. And uh, thanks for tuning in for Weekly Whiskey with uh, John and Jay. Hopefully you guys stick around, subscribe, and next week we'll be here live again on Tuesday doing this again and having a little bit more fun, having some more whiskey. Hell yeah. All right. Well, with that, guys, cheers. Have a good night.